did for the, our meals <coughs> while we were there for the <laughs> studying. We would she'd go around the thing with the plastic bags and keep filling them. And we see nobody was looking, and she'd go around again. <laughs> so that was how we managed we, to survive. We've not changed, have we? Jim? No, we've not changed. No. <laughs> So we had a great time um, and I came back and went to Zurich over many years training in diners, been back doing various things. Um, and it was on that visit that Diana um, introduced me to Franz Jung, who was Jung's son, and we went to tea with Franz Jung. And there was also on the course at that point was this young Christian brother called Michael, who we sat over there. So he's not quite as young as he was then. Uh, and we all, the three of us, went to tea with the young son in his house and we heard stories. We sat there for hours hearing stories of his father um, and all the other side that we don't hear about. Um, we had a wonderful day there. And Diana is today wearing one of Young's rings that um, uh, Young gave to her father. So she's channeling Young today while she's with us. Um, Diana returned and was trained, did her training in London. I trained as an analyst in Yun, London. Uh, then 20 years ago, I moved to the States, but Diana and I have been in touch ever since, and she came across when she was researching for the book and met Joe Henderson and various people, and we've been in touch continuing. I was with her two years ago um, when I visited her in, in um, Northumberland. She's also been the president of the Sandplay Society, and she's a great Sandplay therapist and still teaches, and supervises and helps people who are going through the process of sample and she has a wonderful sample house in the grounds of her house that people go to do sand trays and work in sand prayer, which is a magnificent way of working um, so she's one of those incredible people that I look up to and inspires me in my work and helps me a lot um, and she's an amazing person um, and very gifted she's also been a professional singer and um, I, she sang in Westminster Abbey in front of royalty when I was organising a big AIDS event and she sang in other places and um, she has an amazing voice. Um, she's one of, one of the most gifted people I know and I'm privileged to know her and grateful for all she's given to me and taught me. And um, she brought me an incredible gift this time, um, which is a letter from Emma Young to her mother, which she's given me and because um, I'm a great fan of Emma Young and I think she was one of the most important people in the world. In, the world of Jungian psychology. So, um, and Diana's got lots of letters from Emma Young, so um, and uh, we agree with that Emma is so important in the field of analytical psychology. St. Francis was the great Franciscan inspiration, but I always say without St. Clair, there'd have been no continuing ministry, no continuing Franciscan life, because Clair kept grounding him and pulling him back and stopping him doing stupid things. And I say that's just what Emma did to Carl. She grounded him and kept him firm on the ground, kept his feet on the ground and helped. That's why the young and well continued, because she grounded him. I think she was an incredible woman, doesn't get enough credit for it today. So um, Diana and I have endless conversations about all these things which we both agree on. So um, it's really wonderful to have her here today and to listen to her talking about her father. And thank you for coming. So. Thank you. Thank you, Jude, and I think I can go home now because she's just given half my time. <laughs> Impact on my life, as well as on the, the world of Jungian psychology, and I was um, prompted to write my book about him uh, some time ago now because in London he had been more or less forgotten. And so I thought it was time to remember him, so that's why I've called it Remembering My Father, so for myself, partly, but also for the world of Jungian psychology. <clears throat> but I also wanted now to give a little paean of praise to, to Jude, who would turn match, <laughs> because I wanted particularly to thank Jude for introducing me to the idea of following this path of Jungian psychology in my, in my, in my life, and encouraging me to embark on the psychotherapy training. And so he suggested, and he's already told you that, in 1986 that we go to the Jung Institute together for the um, summer intensive study program. And that was the inspiration for me, um, which um, made me decide finally to take up a second career and 
train as a psychotherapist in London and without his uh, encouragement and enthusiasm I wouldn't have had the courage to do that and that was where we also met Brother Michael so that was lovely that you could be here. <coughs> um, and also that was for us an extraordinary visit the visit to 223 Seistras, 228 Seistrasa in Kisnaat, whilst we were staying there. And it was Jude who said, let's go and have a look at Jung's house, because I want to photograph the inscription above the door. Vocatus atque non vocatus, Deus adherent. Bidden or not bidden, God is present. So that's what we did. We crept up this long driveway and Duke got his camera and took the photograph and that was when we were surprised by a car coming up the long driveway. So covered in embarrassment, I went up and I said I apologise for trespassing but I wanted to see the house where my father spent so much of his time as a young man. So Franz said, and who was your father? And I said, well, he was Peter Baines. Oh, he said, I remember him. When I was a young boy, uh, he used to scare us all by diving off the boathouse roof into the lake. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you come back and have tea with us at four o'clock? So we were, uh, didn't hesitate to accept, and we went back at four, and um, I'm going to see if I can... There's the house, <coughs> and we had strawberries and cream, and I think we were there. He, he'd said, he gave us a time frame, not more than an hour, and I think we were there two and a half to three hours. Mm -hmm. And he talked to us very frankly about his father, and about Tony Wolfe and his mother, and I said he had a very special relationship to his father because being the only boy, uh, Jung liked to do boy things with him. They sailed on the lake. And he said, told us that he would really have liked to study medicine, but he thought matching up his dad in that respect wouldn't be easy. So he chose architecture because he felt he could make a better job than his dad did of Bollingham. <laughs> <laughs> and so there, there we sat in this lovely room having our tea with the library and this beautiful pot. I don't know whether I can make no, can't do that. Um, but oh, I wrecked it. How do I go back? Oh, uh, just press the back button. Uh, well, I've got them all up at once now. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Um, <laughs> so Is everybody hearing back there? Mm -hmm. A bit more of the good. Ah, there, there we go. go. There we go. Excellent. Yes, okay. That's the one I want. They can't hear back there, and we're having trouble over here. But you can't see. No. Can't hear. Can't, can't hear. hear. Okay, so thank well. you. And anybody else who can't, let me know. And yeah, I'm they're having trouble back there, yeah. Just a little. You too. Okay. So uh, you can see the pot there, in the, right in the center. Mm -hmm. That is a Roman pot mm. with young boys and girls um, dancing around it. So it's a, one, one of the great Jungian treasures. Uh, so that's Bollingham. <coughs> and this is the, his Jung study, uh, where my father had his analysis, and where Jung uh, would have had his confrontation with the unconscious, with his very small room, these two stained glass windows, and um, that was Franz Jung, and with Jude on his left and brother Peter on his right, and I've forgotten the name of the... Lydia. Lydia, next to brother Peter, and then I'm on his extreme left, and he took us um, <clears throat> round the house, he took us round the garden to see all the Jung sculptures, and that, that's the outside of the house, but it's beautiful. So we were extremely privileged, and he even talked a little bit about Tony Wolfe, who was just considered an aunt, but he said there wasn't anything sexual in it. <laughs> so um, 
I want to speak um, of my own, just give, give you a little bit of a format of the talk. I want, first of all, to, to talk to you um, about a memory, my own memory of him, and a dream I had when I was researching the book. <clears throat> and, um, and then I want to talk about um, the, his introducing of Jungian psychology to the UK and his, also his influence here on the West Coast. And, um, and, and then um, I'd like to speak about his childhood, his student days, his service as a doctor in the First World War. And finally, um, I want to speak about <coughs> his work with Jung and his later separation from Jung and the world of Zurich when he moved permanently to England. And there's a lot to cover, so I hope I can get it all in before it's time to finish. <coughs> So, my own memory of him, that is a picture of me and my father when I was a year old. So, I remember my father as a huge presence. His laughter, his voice, his singing, and his personality seemed to fill the house. And, and this wasn't only because I was, when I knew him, a very small child. He died when I was just six. But he was six foot four and a half in height, Whoa. with a big personality and um, he kind of commanded attention wherever he was and when I rode on his shoulders seven foot tall I could look down for a brief moment on my two older brothers. <laughs> <laughs> my reason <coughs> for writing the th this book, um, it's, since I was a, a young woman I'd been thinking of writing a book about my father. But it took me until I was two years older than he was when he died. He died aged 61, um, in, to get round to it. And the main reason for wanting to write it, I think, was to get to know him as an adult. That I think my mother idealized him somewhat. And I wanted to know what he was really like. But um, I, I, uh, as I had all this material, relating to his dream journals when he was analyzing with Jung and all his letters to my mother and his love letters and his letters to Jung and Jung's letters to him. So I had all this material, some of it very personal, intimate material. And so I did learn um, much more about him than one normally would in a father-daughter relationship. And there were things I would prefer not to know. <laughs> and the other reason, but this emerged only after I'd started writing the book, was that he was largely forgotten in England um, in his pioneering role in relation to Jungian psychology had just been removed. And I felt it was important to bring to the attention of those who were working within the Jungian world the significance of the man who did so much to bring Jungian psychology to people's awareness back in the 1920s and the years that followed. A distinct thing happened. I, I went to France. We had a house in France. and I went there to write the book and I had all the material with me. And I came across, was, the writing was in full flood, and I came across a passage in one of my father's journals. The date was December 17th, 1939, when I would have been 18 months old, and he's recording a dream in which he's having a game of golf, and I quote, with a little child present. I'd gone on a bit, I looked back, and I saw that she'd taken off her clothes and was getting into a clear pool by the wayside, holding onto some weeds by the edge. Then to my horror, I saw that the pool was much deeper than it looked and her head was already under water. Now she could be drowned. I could not reach her. I dived in to reach her, but she was drifting away to the left downstream, and I was irresolute, not knowing whether to dive or reach for her. And then he writes about the dream. The dream, of, he's written, Dini, which was my nickname, is my growing point, my little green bud, I have to sacrifice my extroverted tempo and accept the introverted style if my little beauty is to be saved. 
she is hope of immortality. Surely the herb she has in her hand is the herb which Gilgamesh fetched from the floor of the sea. If I am irresolute and too scared to risk the journey under the sea, she has to go instead. And that means she's sucked back again into the unconscious and gets lost. I find this sentence, she is my growing point. Hope of immortality? Whilst I was writing, whilst the writing was in full flood, and it was exactly like a direct communication, and that the writing of the book had been a necessary act of remembering. And then I thought, can such thought in relation to a small child in some way direct the course of their future life? Is this why I'm studying my father's work life, and his life? Why I've written this book and why I am following Jung's path of individuation in my life and in my work? Can a parent's thought a dream about his tiny daughter have such a profound effect. The research and writing in relation to this biography and this talk here today have been something I've always known I must one day accomplish, but it took me until I was, as I said, two years older than he was when he died to fulfill the quest. So the dual quest of discovering my father for myself and for re-establishing him to the world of Jungian psychology in the UK, which he had worked so hard for 20 years to establish. I'm just going to get some water. So Peter Baines brought Jungian psychology to England when he began his practice in London in 1922. And that's when he formed the beginnings of the APC as well. And through his uh, writing, your uh, water is occluding your. Oh, <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> through his writing, his lectures all over Britain, his teaching at the club, his religious broadcasts, together with the great Archbishop Temple, and with Edinburgh psychoanalyst Dr. Winifred Rushforth, and his plans for a centre which would have the threefold task of teaching, of providing a clinical centre, as well as conducting research, he laid the foundations for the English School of Jungian Psychology. His plans for a Jungian centre were already in place at the time of his death in 1943. Peter was also pivotal in organising Jung's visits to England to give the Tavistock lectures in the 1930s, to lecture at Bart's Hospital, at Oxford University, and at the club. He had plans for founding a research fellowship, hopefully at Oxford, in analytical psychology, and of writing a primer for beginners in the dynamic psyche. His energy was extraordinary, and he believed with absolute certainty that analytical psychology, the human journey towards individuation, was the ultimate necessity for our individual and our collective development. He worked towards introducing Jungian concepts of consciousness and self-awareness, the individuation process towards wholeness in the medical schools, in the church, and in this he had a strong ally in Archbishop Temple, and in the universities. Because of the threat, the terrifying evil power of Hitler, mm -hmm. at that time there was an eager response and interest in relation to these ideas which went far be beyond just the, the um, clinical aspect. And these ideas during the war years, and the, war, the, the years immediately preceding the war, were, um, it was a, a very um, <coughs> e eager climate for these ideas then. But I wondered how many people who practice Jungian psychology today have heard of Peter Baines. Probably not many. And yet it was he alone who led the Jungian world in London from 1922 to 1943, with intervals in between when he was working as Jung's assistant in Zurich. Uh, Michael Fordham, do you, do you, are you familiar with Michael Fordham? 
he paid tribute to Peter um, when he took over the leadership of the Union community after Peter, Peter Bain's death in 43, remarking <coughs> that the success of Union psychology and establishment of a Union society, and I quote, is really with Dr. Baines, who worked for a great many years in England, and he really fought for analytical psychology and made a place for it. I remember when I started to be an analyst, he was really the only one of any calibre in England at all. My father, as well as being the pioneer of the School of Jungian Psychology in England, also had some impact on the beginnings of the Jungian group, the Jungian school here in the West Coast. It was in the summer of 1928 when Peter Baines and his then wife, Carrie de Angelo, took a sabbatical at Carrie's small house beside the sea at Carmel. They were involved together in the translation of Jung's early works into English, and Carey was working on the translation of the E. King into English. The Wilhelm had translated it in, from the Chinese into German, and I think the definitive translation today into English is the one that Carey did. <coughs> um, while they were in Carmel, Peter was introduced to a young man whose name was Joseph Henderson. So he's not a very young man that. <laughs> and um, he had been having an analysis with a student of, of Jung's called Elizabeth Whitney in San Francisco. And he had been eager to learn more about Jung's psychology and was especially interested in the ideas around the collective unconscious and archetypes. So when Elizabeth Whitney went for her holiday to Carmel, she suggested to Joe that he accompany her in order to meet Peter Baines. So Peter introduced Joe to Jung's concept of archetypes, to Jung's writing about the Gnostics as well as the Seven Sermons of the Dead. Joe said that Whitney was dismayed when she heard, when he told her what they'd been discussing. She said, he gave you seven sermons of the dead, and you're only 25. <laughs> that's, that's, that belongs to the second half of life. But it was extremely important for Joe, and these meetings with Peter were life-changing. He said that Peter became for him an opener of the way. I think I would say the same for me with Jude. Peter encouraged him to come to Zurich to analyze with Jung. At first, this seemed impossible. Joe commented, I was tightly in my little introverted world. <laughs> he couldn't see how he could ever find the money to go to Europe. But Peter said to him, if you want to do it, you will find a way. And sure enough, he did. He gave up his job in journalism and began teaching at his old school, Lawrenceville, in New Jersey. He said he lived like a monk and managed to save practically his entire salary in 1929 he saved enough to go to study with Jung in Zurich. And um, it was lucky that he got there then because 1930 was the Depression and he would, wouldn't have had the money to do it, would have gone. So he was just in time. Joe was welcomed at the house that Peter and, and his wife then, Carrie, were renting in Kilchberg, which is a suburb of Zurich. And it became for Joe a home from home and he became deeply attached to Carrie. And it was traumatic for him when their marriage ended a little while later. At first, Joe analyzed with Jung. He had three sessions a week. And then, he said, in the second year, he had a second analytic session with Peter Baines. And Jung felt it helpful to have a second analyst with a, a different personality type. So Jung and Peter's personality types were exactly opposite. Joe said that Peter became his part-time analyst. He described Jung's approach as deeper and Peter's as broader. The two together, encompassing, he said, the whole dimension of the cross with both the vertical and the horizontal characteristics. I don't think anybody does that today, do they? Do you ever heard of that? 
having two analysts. No, that would be extremely <laughs> complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you did that quite a lot. <clears throat> Are you hearing me all right now? Yeah, good. <clears throat> so, in the 1930s, Joe went to London to study medicine at Peter's Training Hospital, Barts. And after his qualification, he would visit Peter in, and his new family, at this time um, Peter was married to my mother, at their home in Surrey. And it was here that Joe met his future wife, Helena Cornford, who was the daughter of old Cambridge friends of my father's, Francis Cornford, who was the granddaughter of Sir Charles Darwin, and her husband, the Plato Corn scholar, Francis Cornford. And then at Bart's Hospital, Joe was to meet another American medical student, Joe Wheelwright, who was also interested in studying with you, perhaps. He was influenced by Joe Henderson. And for a time, Joe Wheelwright also had analysis with Peter and later went to Zurich together with his wife Jane to have analysis with Jung. And the Wheelwrights also were frequent visitors at my parents' home. So I feel that Peter has also had considerable influence in relation to the beginnings of Jungian psychology in the West Coast also. And I believe that these two splendid pioneers, the two Joes, and their very opposite personality types, established a, a unique school of Jungian psychology. According to Thomas Kirsch's books, the, the Jungians, it is one of the few places in the world where in the beginning two Jungian analysts of very different personality types were able to found a school of Jungian psychology without the need to split. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Kirsch suggests that, English, that Elizabeth Whitney was a strong influence in enabling these two very different individuals to work harmoniously together. But I never heard of any splits happening in this part. We've had so many in London. Five, I think we've got five distinct groups now. So now I want to talk a little bit about my father's beginnings, a little bit about who he was and where he came from. So he was actually christened Helton Godwin. Um, the name Godwin was from the social reformer um, William Godwin, who was a relation of his mother's. And, um, Godwin was the name he was known by until Jung began calling him Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I've never known why he called him Peter. <laughs> but he was born June 23rd, 1882 in Hampstead, and he came from a very strict, non-conformist background, puritanical and rigid, and he was a rebel. He was a rebel at home, and he was a rebel at school. And here we have his mother, Mary Baines, who was a lovely, warm, generous person. And my father, aged two, and, and, and at three. And here is, a, it's not very clear, is it? Can you actually see? Mm -hmm. That is all right. Your, your glass has drifted again. Oh, into sorry the... about that. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that's his father, um, who was a very rigid person on the left, and his mother behind. And Godwin is, you can see from the arrow, with a mischievous grin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had two, uh, two older brothers and, and an older sister, and then a little sister who was sitting between uh, the nanny and, and father. Um, <coughs> So after five years of working in his father's timber business in Reading, um, which was expected of all Helton's three sons, his father finally agreed to send Godwin to Cambridge to read natural sciences. And after a year, he changed courses to medicine. But at this time, father was having a financial crisis in his business. And the family, another Quaker family, agreed to take pay my father's fees, and this was the family of uh, the Bax family, 
whose sons were Arnold Bax, who became master of the King's music, and, and Clifford Bax, who was a famous writer. Um, <clears throat> and so he arrived at Cambridge, and I sort of feel oh, it was an extraordinary experience for him after um, the restrictions of his home. It was the sort of home you couldn't go to a concert, you couldn't go to theatre, um, or, or parties, all of that, drink, everything of that kind was banned. And so suddenly the freedom of Cambridge was incredible. And I think he felt he, he was a great naturalist, he collected butterflies, so I always thought that it was just like having been pinned down like his butterflies <laughs> all his life, he was suddenly free to fly. Um, he changed, so he changed courses to, to read medicine, um, and the condition was from Mrs. Bax that she would pay his fees on condition that he worked for a year after qualifying for the poor, which he did. But um, he became, um, well, once he was at Cambridge, he became, uh, got a double blue. He was a great athlete. Because of his size, he was immensely strong. So he, he rode in the, the winning crews, Cambridge crew, in both 1906 and 1907. That's him rowing. <coughs> um, and he had a fine baritone voice, and he would sing in the, in the Cambridge Operatic Society. But unusually, also for an athlete, he was part of a group of, of intellectuals, of artists and writers, a surrounding group of book known as the Neo-Pagans. And they were a group of socialist freethinkers who rebelled. Neo-Pagans? Sorry? Did you say Neo-Pagans? Neo-Pagans, oh. <laughs> that's what they were called. <laughs> And they threw over all the Victorian conventions. They broke all the rules, and they would go, men and women camping together, ba bathing naked. You know, this was 1905, 1906. Mm -hmm. So it was really, um, and so around this round group of Brook gathered, um, well, the, the Cornfords were part of that, Frances Cornford, who was the mother of, of Helena, Joe's wife, um, and um, uh, artists, writers, poets, were part of this group. And um, so it was very unusual for an athlete to be part of this intellectual group. So he kind of spanned the whole, uh, the whole spectrum. Then uh, he went to Barts to, to, to study to be a doctor, to do his medical studies, and lived, um, I think he lived at Barts, but he socialized then with the Bax family, and then and they belonged to another group of, um, again, very um, free-thinking artists and writers, and they called themselves the, the Nursery Fabians. So <laughs> <laughs> they were, well, Rupert Brooke was also part of that, but D.H. Lawrence and Eleanor and Bertie Fudge and Edward Thomas, the Olivier sisters who were cousins of Sir Lawrence Olivier, and the <coughs> pianists Myra Hess and Harriet Cohen, there were so many of them. And um, so he and one other doctor, Maitland Radford, were the only two there who needed to earn a living. <laughs> so the others were painting and playing music and so on. And then um, discussing everything, the social mores of the time, but also all the arts. And then um, they would go at weekends to hear Wagner operas and um, the, the ballet with Nijinsky, that was in, in London at the time, with the Bolshevar Ballet. So, it was, a, again, this very different, two different, very different lives he was leading. Then he qualified. There he is as a qualified doctor. And um, he volunteered to start a mission hospital in Constantinople under the auspices of the Red Crescent Mission during the Balkan War, 1912. And when he returned, um, I think that was six months, and. Clifford Bax said, Tiny doesn't know what fear is. Tiny was the, what they called him. <laughs> <laughs> and then he married this beautiful young woman, Rosalind Thornycroft, whose father was a royal academician. He made some very famous sculptures in London, I think Oliver Cromwell and various others in Parliament Square. So um, very well known 
person, and she was also part of this very liberal group. And um, for the first year, he worked in Bethnal Green, working for the poor, as he had promised. And he said most of the people in that parish were simply suffering from starvation. Um, so in 1913, they moved to Wisbeach, and where he was the first panel doctor, which was, you had to be a fairly stalwart physique to, to, to actually um, take on the, the risks of being the first panel doctor in a place, and the, the previous one had committed suicide. So, so they chose him because he didn't look like somebody who would. Um, he delivered his first child, Bridget, and war broke out, and then um, things changed, very dramatically changed with the outbreak of war. To, to quote Arnold Bax, the First World War put an end to all youthful dreams, and mm -hmm. life would never be quite so carefree or so affluent again. Um, but the, the young people from London <laughs> continued to visit. They would all come up for weekends and have riotous weekends and poetry and so on and play hares and rabbits over the field. So they were children still. They were still enjoying being children. Then by 1916, um, Godwin, Mr. Godwin felt he must join the war effort. And so he left for the front to week, two, two months, I think, before his second daughter was due, 1916. And Rosalind was terribly upset by that. She said he didn't need to join up. Um, it wasn't necessary for a doctor. And so there was a little bit of a rift then, at that time. And she was left with a tiny child and one on the way, and, and no help. So it was very difficult for her. So this is him as a captain in the RAMC. And <clears throat> um, he was hit by a shell. Or he, he was put in charge of a base hospital in Etaples in France. And then he was hit by a shell during the Battle of the Somme and had to return home on sick leave. And this was to save his life. Because a week or two afterwards, the hospital where he was working was bombed and everybody in it was killed. Oh. So that was in Eomis. And on his return to the war, he was sent to Mesopotamia and was to spend the remaining years of the war in Persia. He returned home in January 1919 to find that his wife, Rosalind, had had a daughter by another man. His return was a time of sadness and bitter, bitter sadness and loss. He found his marriage was over. He had no home, no family, and no job. In the words of his sister Ruth, he was shipwrecked. <laughs> and he'd become interested in the whole problem of shell shock and had been working at the Maudsley Hospital in London. Was it here, perhaps, that he first came across Dr. Hume? <laughs> he may well have come across Maurice Nichol who had for some years been a follower of you and also Constance Long. Um, but however it was, he was to meet Dr. Jung for the first time in the summer of 1990. And this was to change the whole course of his life. At the beginning of his paper, of my father's paper, A Demonstration of Analytical Practice, Peter wrote of his first meeting with Dr. Jung. And I quote, I went to call on Dr. Jung in his home by the edge of the Lake of Zurich. He did not try to teach, to illuminate, or to impress. In fact, he made no effort of any kind. <laughs> but what he said had for me the character of a rare natural experience, as though for a moment I had stood on the rim of the known world and looked over the edge into the source from which all living form forms had sprung. I entered a door that seemed like many similar doors from which I had emerged unscathed. But this one was the last. I could not leave it. I had 
been gripped by a view that went to the roots of mental life, and this experience changed the course of my life. After this first meeting, he wrote home to his parents to say that he had learned more in a single hour with Dr. Jung than in the whole of the rest of his life. This meeting with Jung also marked a dramatic change in the way that Godwin lived his life. He was an overwhelming extrovert. He loved people, loved to be at the center of every activity. He was loved by men and women alike. He'd been hero worshipped by so many, and now it was his turn to give his total loyalty, devotion, and admiration to C.G. Jung. So with you, he learned for the first time the value of introversion, the value that comes from within rather than that which relates to outer things in terms of achievement and popularity. He first began to analyze with Jung in February 1920. Jung provided a port in a storm where he could reconsider his one-sidedly extrovert attitude, which had led to this breakdown of everything that had meaning in his life. He was now forced to discover the introverted way. It's very remarkable to me is the speed with which he did learn this. It is analysis of his dreams just one month after he started analysis with you are quite astonishing. His understanding already, when you think that there's nothing to read in those days, nothing of Jung's had been published, so he had no pre-knowledge of what Jungian psychology was. But he already seemed to have an understanding of the significance of symbols, of archetypes, and of the truths revealed in his own dreams, including his analysis of his own shadow. It, it's more insightful. Many of these interpretations seem to be more insightful than that of many people after many years of analysis. And the gift for me was that all these dreams that he had and these pages long analysis was still that that all the, those um, journals that he'd kept from his analysis with you had been kept by my mother and had survived the time when our house was burned to the ground. So mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a bit of a miracle. So in due course, Godwin was become to, become to know by, by the whole of the Union community as Peter. And before long, he was Peter to everyone except for his close family members, his close friends and family members. I don't know why Jung called him Peter. Was he destined to become the rock of the wider Jungian community? I've no idea. But Peter had embarked on his own journey of personal growth, which was to lead him through times of intense suffering and uncertainty, but would lead ultimately to a real sense of where he wanted to be and who he wanted to be. It was through his struggles with his own personal demons that he felt able at last to help and heal the people who came to him. So Peter's own struggles in life had to do with his father. He quoted a passage from Nietzsche. I ask you, my brother, not what you are seeking freedom from, but what you are seeking freedom for. I'll read that again because it's sort of crucial to his, his journey. I ask you, my brother, not what you're seeking freedom from, but what you're seeking freedom for. This seemed to encapsulate his life's journey. He was, in the first half of his life, desperately seeking freedom from his father's neurosis. His heroic achievements as a young man were proof to him that he did not have his father's fears. Finally, he had to acknowledge that he was profoundly affected by his father's crippling agoraphobia. The fear he had been running from could not be escaped. It was the breakdown of everything that had value for him that finally brought him face to face with this fear. He wrote while he was in analysis with Jung, when analyzing a dream in which he appears which Jung appears first as himself and finally as Peter's own father, I am a man with two fathers. As Jung's son, I have some meaning and importance, 
that as the son of my father, I am given a problem. At this time in his life, having to face his own fear as well as his father's. And he discovered during the time that he was in analysis that it was during the time that his mother was carrying him that his father had his breakdown. So they always thought that the son of, of this time would turn out to be a very broken son because, because that was when the father had the breakdown. So he was a surprise. Um, and he was the one who in his youth had been identified with almost superhuman strength. But a different kind of strength was projected onto you. The strength of a man who has come to terms with himself. And this led to many years of dependence on you. And, but in another sense, you was also dependent on Peter for the outer and practical aspects of his work. So Peter was to become Jung's first medically qualified assistant when he first started working with Jung. The only other people working with him were Emma Jung and Tony Wolf, just those three. Um, <clears throat> and so as, as the, he, he was made responsible for organizing congresses, congresses, also he was responsible for the preparations of their East African expedition for providing a welcoming home for Jung's English-speaking students and for the translation into English of all of Jung's earliest writings together with his co colleague and companion and later to become his wife, Gary de Angulo. Jung wrote, no one can free himself from his childhood without generously occupying himself with it. I, I don't understand why there is a split between archetypal and developmental unions because nothing could be more developmental than that. But no one can free himself from his childhood without first generously occupying himself with it. It was issues in relation to both parents that occupied Peter in the early days of his analysis in 1920. During the first months of analyzing with Jung, Peter began to see both his parents in a more compassionate light. And he also began to see himself with quite remarkable and endearing honesty. He became aware of his own shadow as he analyzed his dreams, no longer accepting the evaluation of others in terms of what Eleanor Fargin referred to as his devastating popularity, or Clifford Bax's heroic description of Godwin Baines, and I quote, who by virtue of his gigantic physique, omnivorous mind, universal goodwill, and overwhelming vitality, became an object of hero worship wherever he went. <laughs> so wow. He no longer identified with this heroic figure. Peter's analysis began in earnest, February 1920, when he went to live in Zurich. And at this time, he was seeing Jung every day. Very early in their work together, Jung appears in one of Peter's dreams, and it is clear that already a powerful transference is in, in force. In Peter's analysis of the dream, he makes the following observation. So I, I'm not going to tell you the dream, it's too long, and the analysis went were pages and pages long. So I'm just this is just interesting because it's a little a uh, window into how Jung worked, really. Um, so he, now we, it is now very clear that Jung is the fortuitous stranger of his dream, and he writes that he's always in the background. Jung is always in the background, felt rather than seen. This is an extraordinary clever symbol for Jung as an influence rather than a person. He's never inquisitive. He rarely asks any questions of one. He seems hardly concerned with the actual nexus and incidents of one's life. He's essentially a guide. He shows one the way, but the actual business of analysis and self-evaluation he has left almost entirely to my own effort. Actually, he knows very little about me and seems to care very little. <laughs> <laughs> and yet it is him, his influence which directs and probes and allows no vestige of dishonesty, 
concealment or self-deception to shield one from the most bitter and bleak self-revelation. Just now he's gone away to Tunis for a three-week holiday. He's been gone nearly a week now, leaving one without specific direction or instructions to one's own devices. And yet I am as deeply under his directing influence as ever. My analysis has certainly improved while he's been gone, and it is done, as it were, under the eye of God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every analysis is made provisionally for his inspections, approval, or criticism. Therefore, this unseen influence of the fortuitous stranger in the dream is really a brilliant symbol of Jung's personality. So I was reading these <laughs> journals whilst I was away in France, and because they were written under the eye of God, nothing is left out. <laughs> so, that was when I really learned much more than I would have chosen to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and then he adds, the sea is, of course, the universal unconscious, which under Jung's guidance and inspiration I am beginning to explore. So his analysis of his own dreams cover many pages of fine, closely written handwriting, gives detailed associations to everything contained in the dream, and having written his own analysis, he would then take the, take the dream to Jung, who would add his own thoughts and interpretations. I believe that this must have been an important dream in the early part of his analysis when Jung was away, and Jung had become for Peter like the eye of God, and there is a sense also of his feeling of loss and abandonment while Jung is away for his three-week holiday. That there was nothing there, of course, in the way of training. So he's away for three weeks. What do you do? For three weeks, waiting for him to come back. And I think it was like that for patients of Jung for a long time until the institute started. During the early weeks of his analysis with Jung, the divorce proceedings were in force in London. And because of Rosalind's famous father, Sir Hamel Thornycroft, it was being closely followed by the press of the day. It was Rosalind who had insisted on the divorce, and she had agreed to take full responsibility, for if Godwin was the one implicated, it would have been impossible for him to continue to practice as a doctor at that time. Mm. Peter writes, and I quote, that he still loves her, and sees her in every way, spiritually, intellectually, and physically, as the ideal mate. However, he also realizes that his roving eye and his irresistible attraction to women made it impossible for, for <laughs> Rosalind, in spite of her progressive views, to continue in the marriage. So in his analysis of his dreams, Peter has become painfully aware of his misuse of woman how, with his ruthless masculine power, he has used woman for his own selfish ends. He speaks of his erotic charger, which has gone out of control, <laughs> that caused the breakdown of everything that he holds most dear. He sees with painful clarity his own incontinence and worthlessness. He writes, a soul can never free itself or forget the sorrow it has brought to woman. The soul can never free itself or forget the sorrow it has brought to woman. This is a time of souls, I'm afraid that isn't the last time that he caused sorrow to a woman either. <laughs> he did at least understand that it was happening. <clears throat> this is a time of soul searching and bleak self-revelation, and Jung's absence must have made this doubly difficult. In one year of intense analysis with Jung, Peter was seeing patients himself. Often he would see a patient of Jung's for extra sessions, as he did with Joe. Sometimes he would take on a patient who had finished working with Jung, but needed some extra help. And Joe Henderson said that Jung would sometimes recommend a patient see Peter alongside their meetings with Jung, as he did with him, because of it being an opposite personality type and allowed insights, of course, from a very different viewpoint. This happened with Joe himself, <coughs> of course. Um, finally, as Jung's chief assistant, Peter had a, a 
very heavy caseload of patients, so that in a sense he was fully qualified after one year. Peter's younger sister Ruth, who went to Zurich to analyze with your gives a description of a typical day in the life of H.G. Baines at this time of his life, in 1921, when he was working as Jung's assistant. She writes, Godwin's days were full, seeing patients in the morning, working on his translations of Jung's psychological types in the afternoons. In the evenings, he went to Jung's house to discuss questions connected with his patients, also to check his translation to make sure that he had grasped the meaning. Some evening we would go and swim in the lake from the Jung's boathouse. Godwin would make them nervous when he dived off the boat house roof into rather shallow water, but he was an expert diver. And other evenings, and this is where, what he's doing now, he went up to the hills behind to throw a boomerang. I remember him doing that, he was very skilled and he could make the thing describe an enormous circle and it would arrive back in his hand. I don't know how he found that stone. Other evenings, uh, Godwin always found time every day to stand at the open window and sing a few scales at the top of his voice. And a Swiss gentleman down the road spent an hour every day practicing on some large wind instrument. But they chose different times. <laughs> <laughs> so what I've got here now is just a few it would have been the Jung family, I suppose, at around about this time. So I think I've given the name. So there's Franz Jung, and Emma Jung, and, and then the little one with dark hair is my father's daughter, Bridget, who was a great friend of Jung's, um, Jung's um, youngest daughter, Lille, she was known as. And beside Lille is Maria. I don't know who the woman is beside beside Bridget, I think that must have been a nanny. And then the one below that <coughs> is, um, that's Franz, standing beside the boat, and uh, two little girls, again, a Bridget and Leo. And there was a story that my sister Bridget told me, that she and Leo used to get up to mischief, and once they went, they were at Ballingham, and they went <coughs> um, to, the, to, to the lake, near to uh, the house, and they started making, they, they were amongst the rushes, and they started making these uh, sort of weird sounds amongst the rushes. And then they were very tickled when they saw it later on that Jung had written that he'd heard these water sprites. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, they, here they are now, um, with the, the one at the top, Bridget's in the front, and, and then France behind her, and then Bridget and France in the lower one with the, their house in the background. Can you see actually? <laughs> so Peter was married a second time to a young woman called Hilda Davidson, who was seeing Jung for her crippling depressions. She was lovely, a gentle, gifted, a graceful young woman with long blonde hair, literally long enough for her to sit on. She was a fine pianist and she could have been a pian concert pianist had she been well enough. Um, she came from a wealthy Edinburgh fam family and her uncle was the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, Ronald, Randall Davidson. I think he was the longest serving Archbishop there's ever been. My father referred to him as a pompous old devil. <laughs> Hilda and Peter fell in love and they married soon after his divorce was announced, but it was not a success. And before long, Hilda's neurotic fears do dominated their marriage. They bought a house in Camden Hill Square and Peter began his first practice in London in 1922. And they had a son, Christopher, who was a beautiful baby and it was hoped that the child would help to heal her. After working with Jung as his assistant in Zurich, together with Tony Wolf and Emma, Peter had wanted to begin his own practice. And it was a momentous act for him to throw away his medical instruments and begin to see patients for analysis. A brave decision also at a time when psychoanalysis was regarded 
still with grave suspicion, and Jung was virtually unknown in London at that time. The APC came into being during Peter and Hilda's early months in London, and it consisted of a handful, handful of people, 12 in all, um, all who had some interest in analytical psychology, and many of whom had been in analysis with Jung. Uh, Peter gave talks, and then they would meet informally at Peter and Hilda's home. And often there would be music when the discussion was over, and Hilda would play, and Peter would sing, Wagner or Brahms' leader. And during this time, Peter was in close contact with Jung. His relationship to him was that of disciple. He saw it as his vocation in life to assist Jung when they were in Zurich, and to spread the word of analytical psychology as widely as possible uh, when he was away from Zurich. He was totally committed to the man who had transformed his life and his understanding of himself and others. He was the chosen son of a father he could respect, love and admire with his entire being. All his scattered en energies which had ranged so widely in so many different directions were now concentrated and focused on this new way of being. But things were not good for Hilda. Peter's hope that the marriage to her would help to heal her was shattered, and on the eve of his expedition with Jung to East Africa, she took her life. Mm -hmm. I, probably oh, she might have been suffering from um, postnatal depression, but nobody knew anything about it at that time. So it was just a tragic thing. And the, this expedition had been organized by Peter in order to study a remote tribe in Uganda called the Elgonyi. Hilda took her life by jumping from the roof of their tall house in Camden Square. She survived for a few days, but suffered brain injuries and died in hospital a few days later, leaving a son of a year and a half. Peter was absolutely devastated. But he had been the organizer of the expedition, and so it was necessary for him to accompany you. Hilda's cremation was on the morning of October the 24th, 1925, and Peter left by, tri by train from Victoria the same afternoon in order to travel by land to Genoa and join his companions, Jung, and a young American, George Beckwith, on board of a liner that would take them to Mombasa. The African expedition is so well known, I won't go into that. Um, but needless to say, it was a difficult time for Peter. Confided to Barbara Hanna, I was a terrible wet blanket in Africa. And they were joined later by a young woman, Ruth Bailey, <coughs> who made a very welcome force to the expedition. So here in this picture, this is when they first arrived. And Ruth isn't actually with them. I've made a mistake there. She's not there. But it's the person on the left is the district commission. And beside, the, beside him is Jung, and then my father. George Beckwith is the one on the foreground on the right. And then this one. That's Ruth Bailey. She made the whole difference to that expedition because I think there were tensions between the men in that, um, at that time. So that's Jung, left, Ruth Bailey, and then and Peter. And on his return, ah, yes, um, when I spoke about this to Joe, when Joe Henderson, where I met him in, at his home, uh, when I was writing the book, He's, he did say uh, that Jung wasn't very good at coping with people's sorrows. You know, he was in his own world and he'd gone there to to do research into the dreams of the Africans, which he actually never did because they never told him their dreams. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, Joe's comment was Jung didn't seem to realize that Peter needed to mourn, so he got little sympathy. Um, on his return from Africa, Peter met again the American woman, Carrie D'Angelo. 
She was also alone with the young child, Jimena. <coughs> Peter and Gary were involved together in the translation of Jung's books and into English, and Gary was also close to Jung, and she and Peter enjoyed each other's company. They married, but very soon it was clear that it was a mistake, and the marriage was short-lived. Carey was an intellectual woman of his own age. He was by now in his 40s, but he was still dreaming of his aspiratrice, his anima figure. Carey could give him intellectual companionship, but Jung had predicted it would end in tears, saying that Carey just wasn't his anima type. So I've rather naughtily put them all together here. <laughs> <laughs> so, the three that were his anima types. You can see that Carrie is very different. And she, and I think a woman of her generation, that a woman, women of that generation who had good minds on the whole, um, didn't want to look very feminine. Because there was an advantage in having a slight, somewhat masculine look. So she, my father complained in his diary that she made no, uh, there was no adornment on her, mm -hmm. no feminine adornment, but she had this wonderful mind. And she was a wonderful person too. Um, so um, after this, there followed, there's a, I don't know whether, why it is that all three of the women he married on the top row are facing in that direction. <laughs> 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 So it's Rosalind on the right and Hilda in the middle and then my mother is on the left. So there followed a period of profound desolation and indecision. Uh, Peter and Carrie were working with Jung in Zurich. Peter had taken over at that time a large portion of Jung's practice to enable Jung to write a book on dreams. And he was seeing patients up to nine hours a day. I didn't know that was even possible to do that. He'd fallen in love with a woman who was 21 years younger than him, and he was literally being torn in two. Above all, he wanted to be Jung's assistant, yet in this girl, he had found at last the person who not only reflected his animal, but who could bring these different aspects of himself together. Spiritual, intellectual, and physical. She was the perfect personification of his animal. He was caught on the horns of a dilemma. If he chose love, he would lose Jung and would have to separate himself finally from the world of Zurich. If he stayed with Carey in Zurich, he was in danger, he felt, of losing the opportunity of bringing the separated parts of himself together. Jung warned him against the relationship. Jung writes in his journal, with the help of CG, I think it was my father who called him CG, that was what everybody did, call him in the end. With the help of CG, I decide that Anne is altogether too fragile to stand the squalls and whirlpools of my anima. Every vestige of personal claim must be withheld. Um, this is rather out of context, but I'm going to show you the next picture, and that's the Zurich Fasnacht. And I don't know if you can read the names there, but um, there's Peter is on the right, Eleanor Bertin beside him, and Tony Wolfe sitting on Jung's knee, and also Mary Bancroft is on Jung's knee, and Heinrich Fietz is on the left. And um, you all know about the, the Zurich Fasnacht, when you can dress up in anything you want and just let your hair down and be what you can't be in normal life. So it's a very important part of Swiss life where things tend to be very formal. And so this is, this is something that happened every year. And so th that must have been quite early days because Tony Wolf looks a very young woman there. So we've, we've got um, Eleanor Bertina on Peter's lap. And I think Heinrich Fierce, I think Jung has got two women on his lap. <laughs> <He's got two. laughs> Mary Bancroft on the left and Tony Wolf on the right. So, he has a powerful dream. 
he's caught on the horns of this dilemma and is being torn apart. And he has a powerful dream in which Anne appears to him as a moon goddess who leads him through a dark underground cavern and gives Peter a powerful experience of his animal and he's brought to the brink of despair. And I think it was a very important dream. So I've often found in my work in sand play that when the anima or animas, animos is first constellated in a sand play process, it very often precedes a very important transformation. The animal acts in a man's individuation process as the bridge between the conscious and the unconscious. She is the unifying energy who, with her guiding light, leads the way in the dark realms, just as happened with Yom and Salome in, in the Red Book. She acts as the transcendent function in bringing about a holy marriage between the conflicting opposites within. When the overbearing mother or dominant wife represented in the tray is replaced by the mysterious presence of an anima figure, wonderful things can begin to happen. So this powerful encounter with Anne in his dream as his anima and soul guide acted for Peter like a catalyst which released him from his own unhappiness and his inability ever to give himself unreservedly in any love relationship. She gave him the strength to believe in himself in a new way. So there followed months of painful indecision as Peter tussled with the problem of breaking the marriage with Carrie. They were fine as colleagues. They married, Joe Henderson said, because they believed it was what Jung wanted. But Jung, on the other hand, could see that Carrie wasn't Peter's animal type and that it would never work. And he said also, because Peter proposed to her, they were both fine swimmers, and he pro proposed to her when they were far out on the lake of Zurich, he said it was too much in the unconscious. <laughs> so it would never work. <laughs> so the separation from Jung was even more painful. Peter felt that in marrying Anne, he would lose Jung's friendship and that he would no longer have credibility as an analyst. Finally, following Jung's advice, he wrote a letter to Anne to say she must find a younger man. Her response was to jump on the next train from London to Zurich <laughs> she arrived at the house of Peter and Carrie, taking Peter completely by surprise. The following day, he took her to see on the Bollingham, where he was staying together with Tony Wolfe. Anne described her two-hour talk with C.G. beside the lake of Bollingham. He used the same arguments against marriage as he had used with Peter, her inexperience and his maturity, and there were different stages in their lives, and so on and so on. And after two years, two hours, Jung had made no impact on her at all. At the end of the conversation, Jung said to Anne, what am I going to do? <laughs> Peter had at the time taken over a large proportion of Jung's practice, as well as the practical aspects of the seminars and conferences in Zurich, and he didn't want to lose him. So Jung realized he'd failed, so he took he took Anne up to his bedroom where he showed her all his beautiful paintings and that was the end of that. Soon after this visit, the final decision was made and Anne wrote to Peter from the train on her way home saying, I think I am more essential to you than anyone else. And he wrote Baines back saying, of course you're absolutely right. Her certainty was exactly what he needed. But it was Emma Jung, with her woman's wisdom, who finally released him from his state of paralyzing indecision. Emma and Peter spent an evening together while Jung was away lecturing to Christians. Peter wrote to Anne, saying that Emma has got your spirit as a woman and would like to know you. She said that the way things are with her and CG is not a solution, meaning Tony, she allowed me to see how she had suffered. So this is the last bit. Now we have time. Yes. Okay. yes. So this is separation from you. 
His last phase of Peter's life was the time for him that was most serenely happy and fulfilled. And it was the fulfillment of all that he had been working for and towards in all those years with you. <clears throat> he had at last resolved his own inner conflict and he was a man at peace with himself, perhaps for the first time in his life. The irony was that the culmination of his years of working with Jung and his own process of individuation had led to the final separation from Jung. And this separation was the one thing that Jung had resisted. <coughs> Anne and Peter created their home together <coughs> and it was a time of deep contentment, well-being and creativity. Joe Henderson visited them in their Surrey home and he wrote, Living with his charming young wife and children, he seemed to have reached as much stability as it is possible for human beings to find on this earth. <laughs> so that's uh, of myself and my two brothers, my father. Peter referred to Anne, who assisted him in the writing of his most significant book, Mythology of the Soul as my gentle collaborator, and he wrote of the healing power of woman. He had indeed found inner peace and true contentment at last. The rest, you know, now began the most, this is the mandala, the painting that he, he gifted to my father. And the rest, you know, and now began the most fruitful and productive period of his life. The separation from Jung meant a closer partnership in some ways. They now became colleagues on a more equal footing and there was a lively correspondence between them. Peter was faithful in all he wrote and in all he taught to the spirit of Jung's teaching. The Jungs came to stay with Anne and Peter at their Surrey home, Reed House, and they enjoyed a memorable holiday in the West Country in 1939, on the eve of the outbreak of war. And this was, they went to see the, the, the tour at Glastonbury because Emma was doing research at the time into the Holy Grail. And it was an extraordinarily happy time for all, and for Peter, it was especially important. He was able at last to show Jung that he had found his own separate path in life and that he was now free to develop in his own way, no longer feeling that he was living in Jung's shadow. And I think this was a problem that many men had with you. It was remembered by all four as a time of gaiety and laughter and also a time that seemed to have great significance for each of them, perhaps because it was the last time they met, that war made future meetings impossible. So Peter wrote soon after this, these years with Anne have been full of rich content. I can never frame in mind I can never frame in words the inexhaustible treasure she has revealed to me. She cares deeply about all the essential goods of which human happiness and well-being consists. She has the most gracious art of companionship. She is a loyal friend and eager lover. In her motherhood, she is frugal and disciplined and wise. She has shown me the healing power of woman. Above all, she's tender in her beauty and never arrogant. She is more than my heart dreamed of. The home we have made together <coughs> holds our treasure. We have put our best into it and it grows fairly in tune with the seasons. My personal inner cup is full and I ask nothing more. But it could only grow at the expense of a certain detachment from Jung and his circle. It continues. I experienced a draught of life altogether deeper and more refreshing than anything that came to me through Jung's acceptance of me. I have learned now to create out of my own being and to follow my own law, and this was the truth that he gave me. Peter had found peace at last in his own inner world, but by 1940 the world about him was in turmoil. A letter he received from Jung at the end of his life encapsulates the cataclysmic events which had overtaken the world. Jung wrote, it is all like talking about the weather in a howling storm at sea, 
or in a snowstorm on a glacier. It does not matter and nobody hears it. The shrieking of the demons is the stillness of the spirit. It means a withdrawal unheard of until one hears the great silence. For Peter, the ultimate great silence was near at hand. It was clear by the summer of 1943 that he was mortally ill. He'd lived his life with a rare intensity and he was both mentally and physically exhausted. He had an amazing gift for enabling others, for bringing people together. His energy and enthusiasm were legendary. Tom Kirsch suggests in his book, The Jungians, that the many splits which have since occurred in the world of Jungian psychology in London might have been avoided if Peter Baines had not died so young. <clears throat> Peter died on the 6th of September 1943, leaving a widow, three young children besides three children of his previous marriages. It left a void of mammoth proportions for those close to him and for the whole of the Jungian world. I just wanted to show you one thing before I finish. If you notice, can you see the ring that my father's wearing? And, and it's this ring, and it was given to him by you. So I rather inappropriately wear it now. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. It's inappropriate. I inappropriately wear this ring. Could you say say more about that? Well, um, I th I just I feel that the inheritance is rather oh, exalted. I thought you said it was inappropriate. <laughs> I inappropriately wear it. Did I misunderstand that? Well, just, no. just, just that, that, that I feel that uh, from young to my father, do I have a right to wear it, really, oh, is what I was thinking. Well, I thought you said it was appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have the right to wear it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it's, it, it's interesting that it was made in the United States, so you've brought it back. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. Made by the Navajos. That's right. That's right. Yes. I, I would just like to say that was so wonderful. Um, that's a lot of information over a whole lifetime. And how you put it together, I just completely was riveting. And Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank, Thank you so well, much. You know, I read the book, okay. and a lot of this is in the books that she has out here for sale. So. <laughs> Selling my book. Jude. For me, it was fascinating because I, I've steeped in Jung for many, many years, but wasn't I began to read all this, I realized how important a figure Peter Baines was, and yet back down, I said, he's never mentioned, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the, old, the old phrase in, in things, and in England particularly, where I, you know, I've lost for 20 years, but I came here 20 years ago. He's not mentioned at all, mm -hmm. uh, and he's so he's such an important figure yeah. uh, in the whole work of the in analytical psychology. And, and, and what I feel too is that he he wasn't limiting his interest in Jungian psychology just to um, giving sessions in psychotherapy. That it was so much wider that he did really have an influence within the church mm -hmm. and within the universities, and that people were interested there. I mean, how many universities? I, I know there is one in Kent. There's a course in Jungian psychology, isn't there? But yes. Yeah. yeah. But I know you know that you're going to go on with your research, aren't you, into his work and get into the church as well? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Yes. Yeah. So. I am. Which is good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, did you feel your father's presence with you behind the inspiration to do this writing? I'm sorry, if you could talk. Oh, did you feel your father's presence behind you when you were inspired? Very much, I did. Absolutely, I did. And because I was reading this very, this very private material, the love letters between my parents, which nobody else would have ever read. Mm -hmm. And they were always kept in a locked deed box by my mother. So um, it was like, I mean, in, in a way, is it even okay to publish stuff that is so personal, in a way. 
So in what form do you think your father's inspiration might have taken in inspiring you? Like your father? Yeah, a lot, absolutely. Very much. Yeah. In what form? I both, because I'm now working as a, as a in a Jungian way, as a psychotherapist. I mean, that was a, and, and I have, um, I don't know whether it's because my mother did talk about him a lot, he was very present in our house, but I have also become a singer, and I also play the violin, and I also love gardening, so I have sort of taken on many of the things that he did. And yet I was so small when he died, so, but I, Perhaps it's in the genes, you know? mm -hmm. but I think that um, I, it was very important for me to get to know my father as a rounded human being, because my mother did certainly um, uh, she idolised him, so we never got any of the, the negative side from her. Question? Yes. Sorry. Well, I want to thank you. It's such a beautiful tribute to your father. But also I'm struck, what it must have been for you to see what your mother was to your father as you were yes. reading and finding all this out. I know. That's a special gift in itself. I yeah. imagine your mother was deceased already by the time you wrote the book. She, yes, she, she, she was deceased by then. She was. And I'm also curious, what was it for your mother to raise three young children? Hard in the war, very hard. Mm -hmm. And no help from the government. You didn't have widow's pension at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and with boys, you know, easier with the girl, but boys are, are more <coughs> difficult for a woman to raise on her own. Yeah, and she struggled. I want to say that while your father may not have been known in London and talked about, actually and probably because of the connection here, he certainly is known um, to ABC here and to the main community here because of the case. Really? So yes. 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 Right? And I think it's because of the you know the Hendersons and the Wrights, who of course were members of the analytical psychology club as well as being associated with the South. I think so. We so we know you know we know his name. We know about his work. Right. This is a true gift. All of this information is just astounding. Yeah. A lot I'm of people. Grateful people. I, I think perhaps why he was forgotten, as it were, in London is because the the Jungian world took a very different route yeah. after he died, mm -hmm. and the person who took over from him, Michael Ford. Um, went much more over to the Kleinian way of working. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so, and he had had analysis with Peter. I just want to say that a lot of analysts from the institute wanted to be here, but they were on vacation. Oh. I just wanted to tell you that. Thank you. Well, I was just wondering about your mother. What your mother was like was like after your father died. And you answered it from this lady here. That she never married again. Yeah. I think she felt, didn't feel able to. She was still a lovely looking woman, but she, she didn't feel any man could um, take the place of my father. He was, because he was such a large personality. Mm -hmm. So she lived on her own for the next 41 years. Mm -hmm. You know, my understanding is that we were supposed to, that our time was over at 2.30, and then they gave us to 3 to get out of here. Fifteen minutes and somebody is peering through the... She said, 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 she